Every year, thousands of people die without leaving a will. If no relatives come forward, then their estates will go to the government. Keeping this money in the family is a job for the air hunters. On today's programme, lightning really does strike twice as the air hunters uncover an amazing coincidence. She's a, a double beneficiary inside 12 months. Um, so it's, it's a little strange. And the search for heirs to a Polish soldier's estate crosses every border. Having a bit of luck on your side is always really important, being able to crack a case. And that's really why I looked into Spain. As they uncover the incredible story of his unbelievable suffering and personal bravery. It's something we in Britain have to be very grateful that we didn't have to live through. Plus how you may be entitled to inherit some of the unclaimed estates held by the Treasury. Could thousands of pounds be heading your way? In the UK, two-thirds of people don't have a will. When they die, the law states that unless the authorities can find an obvious heir, their money goes to the government. Last year, the Treasury pocketed a staggering £18 million in unclaimed estates. That's where the air hunters step in. Bob back from Fraser & Fraser. There are over 30 companies who make it their business to trace the rightful heirs to this money and help them claim it back. Fraser & Fraser is one of the oldest firms of air hunters in the world. It's owned by Andrew, Charles and Neil Fraser. They make their commission by solving cases and signing up heirs. Over the last 10 years, they've enabled over 50,000 heirs to claim over £100 million. Thursday is the most important day of the week at Fraser & Fraser's central London office because that's when the Treasury releases its weekly list of unclaimed estates. Have you got addresses of neighbours there, Joe? The team's first job is to work out which ones are going to be worth the most. That's going to be that first one in 25. This morning, nothing's looking very promising. We're looking at a case of Douglas Walter Greatrex at the moment. Um, I've got a little query about whether it's got any value on it. The air hunters have discovered that the deceased owned a property. This usually means that the estate would be quite substantial. But there is something unusual about this case. He doesn't own the, the lease of the property, but the freehold of the property appears to be in the deceased name. Now, freeholds aren't worth a huge amount of money. It is a property case, but it may be a property case worth a couple of thousand pounds, not a couple of hundred thousand pounds, which we'd hope for. The company has a lot of manpower and resources and can afford to take a chance on some of the smaller-looking cases. So Neil decides to go with it and puts case manager David Pacifico in charge of the investigation. Um, we're going to be working this Greatrex case. It looks like this search will be centred in Birmingham. So David calls Midland-based senior researcher Paul Matthews to get him up to speed. We're not... 100% certain. I'm sorry, hang on a second. Yeah, we need to... Can you do the inquiry? And we need the death of the deceased. OK, cheers. Bye, bye. Thanks, Paul. Bye, bye. Like all the company's travelling researchers, Paul is poised to follow any lead that he's given and make sure that he beats the competition and reaches the airs first. Paul's on his way to Birmingham Register Office. He's already faxed through a request for Douglas's death certificate and his parents' marriage certificate, but now he needs to pick them up. They contain the information the team need to start building up his family tree and tracing heirs. Douglas Greatrex lived his whole life in Birmingham. He was born and grew up in the traditional working-class area of Newton Street in the heart of the city. Several photos survive from his childhood, particularly his time in the Boy Scouts. And according to his close friend Angela Common, Douglas grew up to be a proper gent of the old school. He was smiley, he was friendly, and he was the perfect gentleman. You know, old-fashioned. Yeah, you'd open the door and pay for your tea. And, you know. Angela met Douglas when she went to work for him in his tool manufacturing business. She then left to have a family, but years later, they bumped into each other again and struck up a close friendship. 
By now, Angela was on her own with the children, and Douglas became an important part of their lives. We sort of adopted him and, you know, you sort of tweak into what, oh, what the kids would like and sort of spoil them a bit. And I'd say, Doug, you know, they, they always think they can have what they want, they can't. It's just, just little things like an ice cream or a book and I don't know how many dictionaries he bought for the kids, but uh, he loved his books. Although he ran a successful business, Douglas always felt unsatisfied in his job. I think he resented it because... Um, he wasn't content doing it. It was a means of making money. And he taught to the kids and, think, yeah, you know, encouraged them to do well at school. You know, you don't want to end up in a factory like me. Although he regretted not receiving a better education, Douglas was able to escape from the daily grind into a world of books. He'd go home behind, you know, his front door. He'd be in his office, you know, wall-to-wall -wall books, and he'd be tapping, the, tapping away there and coming up with stories. He was very into his thrillers. With the writing, it, yeah, that was his world. You know, go and get, your, get yourself a lady friend or something. You know, you go, oh, no, I don't need that. My books and my computers, that'll do for me, you know. Yeah. Douglas wrote one story especially for Angela's children, naming one of the characters Amelia after her daughter. He got two copies bound and gave one to the adopted family who inspired him. I think the kids thought a lot of Doug because Doug went out of his way for them. It's like he became that family member and I think he would relish in the thought that he was our family, you know, that, you know, father, grandfather figure. In air hunting, so much rests on the surnames involved. A rare surname like Great Trex should be easy to research because it stands out in the records. But there are other factors to consider. Uh, and we find that although there may only be a thousand people with that surname in the country, they all live within a 20 or 30 mile radius of each other. And that way it just makes it harder to identify the individuals because all the John, John Great Trexes all live in Birmingham, for instance. Sure enough, the team immediately ran into a problem. They know that Douglas's mother's name was Harvey. And researcher Joe has found two marriages between a Great Trex and a Harvey in Birmingham, one in 1916 and one ten years later in 1926. Case manager David Pacifico reckons he knows which one is right. It's likely to be the, the 1926 rather than 1916 because the deceased born in 34. So um, I should hopefully hear something soon from Paul Matthews. But Paul can't help them because he's stuck in a traffic jam on the way to the Birmingham Register office. So until he can get his hands on the actual marriage certificate, the team will have to research both possibilities. Yeah. David, the first marriage, some of us on lame. Debbie has come across the 1916 marriage on a genealogy website, most likely posted by some family member. The first marriage, Doris George E. Greetrix. This is family history, there's some pictures as well. I'll know in the next few minutes whether we, which is the right marriage. But Paul's still a long way from his destination. Luckily, however, he's very well known to the guys in the register office, so he pulls over to see if he can get the answers he needs over the phone. Hello, Johnny, how are you? Hi, John, I've managed to cut about 20 people up and get off the Bristol Road. <laughs> are we smiling? Yes, we are. Presumably, you only want the marriage if the groom is called George Andrew, yes? Yeah? That's correct, yeah. Right, so a discard one of them, the one you... In one call, Paul gets the key facts that he needs to get this case moving. He phones through the all-important information to the office. Right, the marriage. Yeah. 3rd of December 1916. It looks like David's hunch that Douglas's parents were married in 1926 was wrong. So they're all their brothers and sisters. Do you want to work up those marriages? We've got a nephew, then. But the good news is that the correct marriage is the one with the online family tree. So the team already have all the information they need to put it together. Douglas's parents were George Andrew Greatrex and Doris Harvey. They had seven children, two of whom had died young. 
and Douglas was the youngest in the family by a gap of nine years. Doris born in 1925, then a, uh, a nine-year gap, and, and Douglas just uh, just comes out at the end of that. So uh, it's uh, about nine years in between uh, in between it, which may explain why this, this family has split up and separated slightly. What name is that one? John L. Someone's giving me John L's. I gave you John L. Neighbours. The team have made great progress on this case, and it's still only 8:30 in the morning. And it's coming up incredibly quickly as well, so it's quite difficult to keep up with it. I'd be inclined to get another traveller to Birmingham. Ewan's done an inquiry in Windsor. Once he's yeah. done his inquiry in Windsor, then you send him up. Right. David Pacifico calls senior researcher Ewart Lindsay. Hello, Ewart. Hi, Dave. Who's currently in Maidenhead in Berkshire. I've arranged an appointment at one o'clock today in Tamworth. I thought, if I leave that one with you... All right, cheers, Dave. OK, bye. With two senior researchers in the area ready to sign our pairs as soon as the office can identify them, the team are well placed to tie up this investigation in record time. But still to come. An amazing coincidence takes this air hunt into uncharted territory. This bit of tree automatically joins onto here. And one air gets a very unexpected phone call. You won't believe this, but we believe you would be a beneficiary on another estate that we're looking into. Although some air hunts unravel quickly and are concentrated in one specific area, others remain unsolved for years and take in many different countries and a broad sweep of history. Tadish Gaveda was just such a case. He died in 1991 in this house in Forest Hill in South London, leaving an estate worth £37,000, but no will. His case had remained unsolved for many years when Hector Birchwood from air hunting firm Celtic Research took it on. Hector remembers coming across his unusual sounding name on the Treasury's weekly list of unclaimed estates. When I immediately saw the name Gaveda, my assumption at that point was that it was Polish. Of course, that could mean Ukrainian Polish, that could mean Belarusian Polish. Uh, there are a number of Polish communities in Central Europe and in uh, places like Italy or France. So really, at that point, it really didn't tell me a lot. Hector started his investigations by looking for Tadish's death certificate. Well, the death certificate is usually of some help, uh, but the information you get is only as good as the informant, so they may not know the deceased or they may not know as much as they think they know about the deceased. In Tadish's case, although the date of death in 1991 was correct, there was obviously a mistake with the birth, which was also shown as being in 1991. According to the certificate, he was born in Poland. But was that a mistake as well? As a matter of protocol, we always look for the birth in this country, and we couldn't find one. Without a birth certificate or any reliable information, Hector had nothing to go on. He knew that trying to find this information from the public records in Poland might prove challenging. For the moment, he was stumped. Hector then had an inspired thought. He decided to cross-reference Tadish's death by going back to the death index record held in the General Register office. Sure enough, the record revealed that Tadish had been born in 1929. From there, Hector found that he had arrived in England in 1946 with the Polish Resettlement Corps. When the Second World War ended, many Polish soldiers who had fought alongside the British against the Nazis chose not to return to what was now communist Poland. Instead, they came to live in the UK. When the soldiers first arrived, they were housed in temporary camps until they were able to start a new life in this country. Many people who came here during World War II or just after World War II from the Ukraine, from Poland, from many other places, they often had to reinvent themselves and establish themselves in this country. They often could not go back. So that often meant they got married and they had children here possibly even if they had a wife back home. That does happen. Uh, so we were mindful of the possibility that he may have been previously married, but we did look for a marriage for him here. 
and that's what became a cross of marriage. Uh, and that was really the first break in the case. Hector discovered that Tadish married a Carmen Garrido in Wilsdon in London in 1957. Any time we do find a marriage, it does bring up some hope, at least a few glimmers of hope. Uh, there's a possibility that there might be children. Uh, there's a possibility that we may be able to find uh, the spouse's family, who may be able to tell us something about the deceased family, uh, maybe even give us names and addresses of his family. So there are always, you know, glimmers of hope whenever we find a marriage, but we didn't really know exactly where that would lead. With two unusual surnames like Gaveda and Garrido, it wasn't long before Hector came across birth records for some children, born in Ulster in Warwickshire. Tadish and Carmen had three children, a son Roberto and two daughters, all of whom would be heirs to their father's £37,000 estate. Well, once we found the births, it really threw open the case. We could see that the deceased had biological children. They may have been adopted, uh, they may have changed their names, but... Uh, at least it offered an avenue by which we could crack this case and find some rightful heirs for this estate. But then the trail ran cold. Hector couldn't find any further trace of Tadish's children in this country. If they had left England when they were very young, they could have been anywhere by now. But he took a guess that with a surname like Garrido, their mother may have taken them to Spain. Well, having a bit of luck on your side is always really important in being able to crack a case. And that's really why I looked into Spain. It just seemed like it fitted better than other places. I wasn't sure about it, but it looked better than the other options. Another piece of luck for Hector was that he speaks fluent Spanish, so he was ideally placed to conduct an investigation there. One of the things that we did find just by trawling through the internet was that uh, the family of Gaveda Garrido is only centred in one place in Spain, in Valencia. The case was cracked, as far as I was concerned. I just needed to find people and talk to them. Hector found a recent record for Tadish's son, Roberto, online, along with some contact details, so he decided to make a first attempt to contact him. Hello? Me puedo comunicar con el señor Roberto Gaueda, por favor. Still to come. Initially, uh, our contact with uh, Roberto wasn't exactly very successful. Hector's air hunt runs into a spot of bother. My first impression was that it was a con. And in the search for Douglas Greatrex's heirs, one beneficiary gets a lot more than she bargained for. Might pay for a holiday, you never know. Do you? Might get a bit further than Blackpool. <laughs> For every case that is solved, there are still thousands that remain a mystery. Currently, over 3,000 names drawn from across the country are on the Treasury's unsolved case list. With estates valued at anything from 5,000 to millions of pounds, the rightful heirs are out there somewhere. Today, we've got two cases air hunters have so far failed to solve. Could you be the missing link? Could you be in line for a payout? Mustafa Kamal died in Kingston-upon-Thames, Surrey, on the 8th of November 2005. Was he a friend or neighbour of yours? Could you even be related to him and entitled to his estate? Bertha Helen Hudson passed away on the 16th of October 1998 in Sleaford, Lincolnshire. If no relatives come forward, her money will go to the government. But should it be headed your way? If the names Mustafa Kamal or Bertha Helen Hudson mean anything to you, you could have a fortune coming your way. Air hunter Hector Birchwood was searching for heirs to Tadish Gaveda's £37,000 estate. He gambled that Tadish's children had returned to Spain with their mother, Carmen, and his gamble paid off. He found a phone number for Tadish's son, Roberto, who was out when he called, so he left a message telling him that he could be a beneficiary of an estate. Hello? Me puedo comunicar con el señor Roberto Gaueda, por favor. Bueno, pues estas típicas estafas que se hacen ahora, sobre todo... My first impression was that it was a con. You know, one of those internet scams where they contact you and tell you that they've been lucky enough to inherit some money. 
patrimoniales a tu favor, ¿no? una herencia, pues esa fue la primera impresión. As Hector had guessed, Roberto's parents' marriage had broken down and his mother had taken the children back to live with her parents in Spain. Nosotros vivíamos en Madrid. Llamó en alguna ocasión por teléfono y mi madre He called the house one time when we were in Madrid, but my mother was always so scared that he would come and try and take us away. Legalmente porque mi madre lo que hizo Legally she had been in the wrong. At that time, he needed the father's permission if children were going to leave the country without him. del padre que en aquella época en Inglaterra para poder salir del país pues se requería de la firma del padre. Tadish never made another attempt to contact his children, and Roberto's mother never spoke of him. So Roberto's only knowledge of his father were a few photos and the stories told to him by his grandfather. Mi, mi abuelo vino aquí a Inglaterra cuando nosotros éramos... My grandfather came to England once with my grandmother when we were very little. He met my father, and it seems they had a lot in common. Era muy inteligente, muy trabajador. He always said he was a very intelligent man and a very hard worker. So I can't help thinking that I'd have loved to have had the chance to talk to him. Gustavo, pues, eh, poder hablar con mi padre y... But after talking to Hector, Roberto decided to come over to England to find out what he could about the father he never knew. For me, this is the final conclusion of my father's life. The great thing is that now I have the chance to finish the story. Being able to fill in the gaps of his life that I never knew will help me to understand him better. With the case solved, Hector arranged to meet Roberto to give him the information and paperwork provided by the Treasury. This included the immigration application that was written by the Home Office when Tadish arrived in Britain in 1946. This brief paragraph gave a fascinating insight into his early life during one of the darkest periods of European history. The document revealed that his father was actually born in France in 1929 and that the family only moved to eastern Poland in 1933. But any hopes of a peaceful family life were destroyed when in 1939 Hitler's army invaded Poland and Tadish was thrown into the chaos of the Second World War. Poland was invaded by the Nazis on Friday the 1st of September 1939. A week or so before, the Nazis and the Russians had signed a non-aggression pact which more or less gave Hitler the green light to invade Poland and also secret clauses were in place that actually gave Russia the green light to invade eastern Poland, which it did on the 17th of September 1939. Ten-year-old Tadish was captured by the Russians and deported along with thousands of other Poles to a Russian labour camp. Conditions, I mean, in all Russian labour camps were extremely harsh, not only for those uh, Poles that, that perceived as the class enemies of Russia, but also, of course, the people that had been uh, swept up under Stalin's purges and put into the gulags. With very poor food, long hours of, uh, of hard and sometimes senseless labour as well. Then, in 1942, Hitler invaded Russia and Tadish was dragged back to Germany to work as slave labour for the Nazi war machine. The German war economy was so dependent on foreign labour. Uh, to give you an example, in 1944, there were over 7 million foreigners working in Germany. The vast majority were slave labourers that the Nazis had taken in manhunts throughout eastern occupied Europe. Amazingly, Tadish, still only in his early teens and risking execution if he'd been caught, managed to escape from Germany. Somehow, he crossed the border to Italy and hooked up with fellow Poles. His army records showed he joined the Polish Resettlement Corps in 1946 to help with the cleanup. Tadish's incredible journey came to an end not long after, when he arrived in England to start a new life after the chaos of the war years. 
Well, I think that the Tandrush story is not an untypical one for people that lived in Central Europe, and it's something that I think that we in Britain have to be very grateful that we didn't have to live through. I'm afraid it is so typical of so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and especially younger people, who were really a, a, a buffeted between the two sides of National Socialism, Nazism uh, and Soviet Communism. Having learned about his father's astonishing history from Hector, Roberto then set off on the final stage of his journey to Kington Camp in Herefordshire. According to the records, this was where Tadish had been housed along with many other Polish soldiers when they first arrived in this country. Local historian Kenneth Reeves showed him round the camp. Yes, these are the sort of huts that your, your father would have uh, been billeted in. Of course, they were originally built for the American army as, as a hospital. They were designed to last for 25 years. And that was in 1943. They've now been here something like 66 years. And they're rather beginning to show their age, and most of them have fallen down. Compared to what Tadish would have experienced in Germany and Russia, this camp would have been like a five-star hotel. But for Roberto, it was a very moving experience. Una impresión triste. Triste. It makes me feel sad, very sad, how my father could have survived before, during and even after the war. I had no idea before all this how he could have endured such a terrible life. So, this is it. The end of a story that I didn't get to hear about firsthand. But at least now I can say that I know about my father's life and it's helped me to understand him. Tadish's life, and that of millions of Europeans caught between the Nazi and communist regimes during the war, was one of unimaginable suffering and hardship. Sadly, Tadish never got to see his children grow up, but he did manage to leave them a legacy of £37,000, which was ultimately shared between the three of them. For Hector, it was a satisfying end to a case that could have remained unsolved if he hadn't retrieved it from that bottom drawer. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased that the case uh, eventually came to a successful fruition. Uh, first of all, because uh, I could justify the amount of time I'd spent on this case. Um, second of all, uh, because my hunch uh, was right in going to Spain. More than that, really, is that I was very happy to know that some of these cases that are unsolved can still be solved and can still be cracked if you have enough determination, or at least if you have the right kind of luck, like I did. Fraser and Fraser have been looking into the case of Douglas Greatrex, who died aged 75 in Birmingham. Douglas was the youngest of his siblings by several years and had fallen out of touch with his extended family. When he died, he owned a property, but he didn't own the leasehold, which will have affected the value of his estate. It is a property case, but it may be a property case worth a couple of thousand pounds, not a couple of hundred thousand pounds, which we'd hope for. The team got off to a great start with their investigation, and it wasn't long before they'd managed to trace 16 of Douglas's heirs. Someone's giving me John L's... I gave you John L's neighbours. There's quite a few... Yeah siblings of the deceased and this is near kin. For the air hunters, if they can't find any children of the deceased, the next best result is to find near kin, meaning siblings or nieces and nephews. Hi, Paul. Hi, Diane. Listen, we've got it up to date with near kin on it. Oh, right. And we've got addresses of at least a couple of nephews in Birmingham. OK, catch you later. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Paul's just round the corner from the first address that he's been given, so he heads straight round there. There's no one in, so he tries the neighbours. Oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to get hold of your neighbour, Trevor. Does he work in the day? Yeah. Paul calls David Pacifico in the office to give him the bad news. It's always the way we get, we get the early breakthroughs and get it up to yeah, date, no. and uh, but people are at work, aren't they, so? We've got a couple more addresses. For Trevor's siblings? Yeah. We've got a Roy living at... Yardley. Right. Okie-cokie, right. Dave. 
David has finally managed to make an actual appointment with one of Douglas's heirs. His nephew, Roy Stevens, is the eldest son of Douglas's sister, Doris, and her husband, Sidney. Mr Stevens, yeah. Yeah, Paul Matthews, Fraser and Fraser, we're a probate research company. We deal with the estates of people who pass away without making wills, and we trace relatives, and we think you're entitled to an estate we're dealing with. Can you spare me a few minutes? Yeah. OK, that's great, thank you very much. Paul needs to check that Roy is actually Douglas's nephew. So he gets straight down to business. Right, your mum, um, Doris, she, did she have brothers and sisters? Yeah, Dougie. Right, OK, let's... Not in Ghana, did it? Uh, yeah. Dougie. It's Dougie. I had a horrible feeling he with Dougie. Yeah, he, uh, he passed away. He hasn't... Uh, yeah. Roy remembers Douglas well, so his death comes as a shock. On, yeah, OK, you OK, take your time if you want. Okay. OK, so Dougie, yeah. What do you know about Dougie? We actually seen a lot of Dougie up until Mum went, and then all of a sudden we sort of... We lost sort of him right then. Just disappeared. Mm. How long ago is that? Many years? Oh, a long time ago, now, yeah. Uh, I guess that uh, at the end of the day, Dougie saved a few bob fair play to him because uh, we had been out. <laughs> <laughs> He's obviously saved it for you. He's so wait, if you get a few bob, what are you going to do with this? Anything? I don't Just... know. I don't know. Have a drink. Have a drink. OK, that's nice. OK, all right, thanks for your time. I'll speak to you later on. OK, cheers. Bye-bye. By the end of their meeting, Roy is happy for Fraser's to assist him in his claim and Paul's delighted to have signed up his first heir. But just then, something rather extraordinary happens. Back in the office, Neil has just made a connection that takes everyone by surprise. What we've just found now <laughs> is um, this is a, a tree which I just printed off um, from, from a case uh, run by Marcus uh, at the beginning of this year. Eight months ago, the air hunters dealt with the case of a Peter William Greatrex, also from Birmingham, who it turns out was Douglas Greatrex's nephew. Now, Peter William, his father was William Arthur Greatrex. William Arthur Greatrex is on this tree over here, sat here as a brother of the deceased. So this, this bit of tree automatically joins onto here. If Peter Greatrex had lived, he would have inherited some of his uncle Douglas's estate. But as it is, his share will pass to his daughter, Samantha who eight months ago discovered that she was to inherit from her father's £6,000 estate. I think Jess she is now a beneficiary yeah. on uh, this estate as well, so she's a, a double beneficiary inside 12 months. Um, so, so it's a little strange. Ten months ago, when Samantha was contacted during the last series of Air Hunters, she learnt that her father had died. The news was a great shock to her, as her parents had split up when she was a baby and that was the last she'd seen of him. It was strange that it was a loss. I felt a loss. Although you've lost some, somebody who's a part of you, you know nothing about them, and um, that's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. I always thought that I'd get the chance to at least say goodbye. That sounds a bit strange. Say goodbye to somebody that you don't know. Less than a year on, and the air hunters have another reason to get in touch with Samantha. I've got a phone right now. Right. It's fallen to case manager David Pacifico to break the news to her that she's lost another relative. Hello, Miss Greatrex. It's Fraser and Fraser. Hello there. Um, you won't believe this, but we believe you would be a beneficiary on another estate that we're looking into. Well, this, this one was going back to your grandfather's side of the family. Yes, unbelievable. Samantha is also based in Birmingham, so David sends Paul straight round to see her. Hi, Samantha. Paul Matthews, Fraser and Fraser. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Cheers. Paul goes back over Samantha's family tree to show her how she's related to her deceased great-uncle Douglas. Right. Do you know anything about your, your grandparents at all? No, only what I got told by Fraser's, and that's their names. <laughs> For Samantha, it's the second time in less than a year that she's been confronted with information about relations that she never knew she had. 
It's sad the circumstances it comes about under, but this one's a, a nice one compared well, to the last. It's very, very distant. You never knew the person. Yeah. Um, and so his estates are they going to go to people like yourself or to the government, so it's better going to you and yeah. you can add it to the other one. That's it. At least yeah. I can get somewhere with it. Well, yeah, right, what, you might pay know. for a holiday, you never um, know, do you? Might get a bit further than Blackpool. <laughs> Samantha's very happy to let Fraser's assist her on making her second inheritance claim, so she signs up. This is, you've got one of these already, you can collect them. <laughs> yeah. You're totally unique. Twice in ten months, fantastic. Paul's got a busy afternoon ahead of him, so he heads off to his next appointment. All the very best for the future. I hope you get a nice sum of money. Thank you very much. Cheers, bye-bye. Bye. In all, the team have uncovered 16 heirs to Douglas Greatrix's estate, who all need to be visited and signed up. Luckily, senior researcher Ewart Lindsay has just arrived in Birmingham to help and has gone straight to the house of one of Douglas's nieces. Hello, Mrs Margaret. Hi, my name's Ewart Lindsay from Fraser and Fraser. All oh, right, OK, yeah. Right. Do you want to come in? Thank you. Yvonne is the daughter of another of Douglas's brothers, Harry Greatrix. She, along with her four surviving brothers and sisters, all stand to inherit from their uncle's estate. Do you have an idea who, who the deceased is? Yes, yeah, it's OK. That's correct, that's correct, yes. Unlike Samantha, Yvonne did know her uncle Dougie, although she hadn't seen him in a long while. Do you know if he, if he have his own house? I really don't know. I mean, gosh, the last time I seen him, he was living with my nan, his mother. In the end, Fraser signed up all 16 of Douglas's heirs. His estate turned out to be worth £13,000, which was split between them all. None of them got a life-changing sum of money, but they all got a reminder of the importance of family and a dear and long-lost uncle. Well, I saw him probably when I was 15, so we're going back 30 years now. Very rarely saw him, actually. He used to be quite a recluse. He sort of kept himself to himself. The first thought that crossed my mind was... Did anyone who buried him? You know, was it family? Was it friends? Someone, you know, who knew him. Not nobody who didn't know him. Although Douglas wasn't a very outgoing person, he did have a few close friends who were there for him at the end and gave him a proper send-off. The funeral itself was taken by his local vicar, the Reverend Greg Mensing. Occasionally, there are funerals which I take, like Doug's, um, where there are very few people, but they were all there because they loved him, um, because they wanted to pay their last respects to a man that they cared for. Of those who did attend the funeral, he will be missed most by his dear friend Angela and her children, who were his surrogate family. For weeks after he'd gone, the phone would go on a thing, on often wish. Is that Doug? It took, really took a while to, to accept. That's not him on the end of the phone anymore. Yeah, it was just that, you know, that phone call, phone call out of the blue. Hi, how are you doing? We don't get that every day, do we? And I think that was nice, and he always made you smile. He wasn't happy unless he put a smile on your face. If you would like advice about building your family tree or making a will, go to bbc.co.uk. Well, next we catch up with the Ashton family now living in Adelaide. Did they find what they were looking for down under? They and Martin and Lucy choose two more of their favourite stories from the archives in the best of Homes Under the Hammer at 11. And on Monday morning, Animal 24-7 returns to BBC One at 9.15.